WNYC-TV presents Barbara Lee Diamondstein and... Our guest today is that member of the city administration whose specialty has become the art of politics and the politics of art. It's a special pleasure to welcome Henry Gelsaller, the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs for our city. Henry, you've been on that job now for at least half a year. Can you tell us some things that you've learned? Can you tell us about your department, its focus, its aspirations? What does the Department of Cultural Affairs do? This is a half hour program and I've been in my job <laughs> since the 10th of January. The amount that I've learned on the job is really staggering and I'm extremely grateful to the mayor, Ed Koch, for having taken me out of the Metropolitan Museum where I knew exactly what I was doing to the point of feeling as if I were being incarcerated and giving me the responsibility for uh, mayoral policy and action in a much broader range of activities. The Department of Cultural Affairs is just about two and a half years old. It was formerly, as you know, part of the Parks Department. It was called Parks, Recreation and Cultural Affairs. It became apparent during the Lindsay administration that uh, the special requirements of the Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Natural History, the Bronx Zoo, the New York Botanic Garden, the Brooklyn Museum, the 25 cultural institutions that regularly receive contractual money from the city were not really the same thing as the pruning of trees in the park and the recreational aspects of the park. And there was a, a commission named after Martin Siegel, who was the first chairman of the Commission for Cultural Affairs, that suggested that the department be spun off. So what I'm doing is really learning at the same time as I'm helping shape something which is new as a separate entity, a Department of Cultural Affairs. The excitement is in finding myself with a mostly inherited staff of terrific quality. I thought before I came to work for the city that municipal workers were sluggards who uh, were cousins and nephews and came to work late and weren't very involved. If my department is any indication, they get there at 8 o'clock and work until 9 or 10, four or five days a week, many of them. And I'm, I'm delighted with the quality and intensity of my staff. Well, I suspect you couldn't accomplish much without them, partially because you are so understaffed and underbudgeted. You talked for a moment about the delight of your job, but what about the frustration? this cultural capital of ours that we keep talking about and really don't have the kind of funding either to support in its present state or to extend the way you and so many others of us would like to. How do you deal with that? I haven't quite come to the end of the delight. I see the frustration over the next hill. And the, uh, the frustration is that I'm trying to do about a $75 million job with a $26 million budget. And the, of that $26 million, how much of that is discretionary? Let's put it the other way. Of that $26 million, 90% of it is earmarked through historic contracts to institutions that are in city-occupied buildings on park land. And again, I mentioned the, the primary ones, the Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Natural History, the Brooklyn Museum, the Bronx Zoo, the uh, Brooklyn Botanic Garden, etc. The frustration is enormous because the city as a international and international and national cultural resource depends heavily on these important cultural institutions. On the other hand, Ed Koch was elected mayor of the city of New York, uh, a city of eight million who live in boroughs, who are not necessarily uh, part of the constituency for these major international uh, institutions. And the frustration that I see in the job is, as you pointed out, uh, by implication in the very small amount of money that's available in the general grants program to those groups within the city that are emerging, that are avant-garde, that are ethnic, that are racial, that are neighborhood, community, borough. What I want to do is to increase the amount of money that's avail available for them without punishing those who have contracts with the city. Let me try to explain for a few minutes what it is that the city has done over the years with institutions like the Metropolitan Museum. In 1870, a group of gentlemen, there were no ladies at that point in the, in the uh, 
trustee body, a group of gentlemen got together and decided that it would be a good idea for New York City, which had plans to be a great international city, to have a museum, encyclopedic museum of world consequence. The founding trustees, who were uh, poets and painters and sculptors and financiers, came to the city and made the following arrangement. The city would build the building on city-owned land, parkland for the most part. The city would guard, maintain, heat, and light this facility. In these other words, these make historic it contracts that you talk exactly. about. Exactly. The city would, would provide the platform. But private enterprise, private philanthropy, would determine the intellectual content. The private philanthropy, the trustees, that is, would own the collections, would hire the intellectual staff, meaning the curators and the educators, would determine what exhibitions were made available to the public. And this municipal philanthropic marriage, I think, is, uh, is one that should be imitated everywhere. I don't think for a moment that when the New York State Council on the Arts or the National Endowment gives money for an exhibition like the Cezanne show, they're do making a mistake. But I think within a city where there's such a great closeness between municipal government and its own constituency, a prudent distance uh, is, is, well, is well intentioned and, and well met. So that the, the way it works is that the, the city makes accessible to the widest pu public possible as many of these zoos, botanic gardens, performing arts centers, museums, historic houses, nature conservancies as possible. And the way our tax system works, and it's a, a very healthy tax system as far as uh, the cultural life of the nation goes, the private philanthropic uh, sources and the general public keep the institutions open. The Metropolitan Museum, for instance, now has a membership of 50,000. It's reached a point where they are seriously considering stopping the increase in membership because it's impossible to treat... To support that kind of membership, too. Well, the point about being a member is that you're treated specially, mm -hmm. and it's impossible to treat more than 50,000 people specially. And also the cost of maintaining that special relationship. So the fact that all of this, 90% of this $26 million is earmarked to these historic contracts with the 26 institutions means that I have very little discretionary money left for what I call the disenfranchised, those groups that came to America after these contracts were uh, put in force, uh, those groups that ha are identifying themselves in uh, new ways, uh, the avant-garde, the experimental, the, the neighborhood stabilization aspect of uh, community arts is terribly important today. And I refuse to be a commissioner who tells his constituency year after year, don't worry, things will get better. I don't believe in promises, I believe in producing. And the mayor is a mayor who understands the importance of the cultural life of the city. I wouldn't have left the cloister of tenure at the Metropolitan Museum if I hadn't felt that once Ed Koch gets the city back in some kind of uh, rigorous fiscal shape, one of the places that the money is going to start to flow is into cultural affairs. I'm not giving you a chance to ask me questions. I'd like to for just a <laughs> moment because there are about four questions that you raise. Actually, you've answered one of the things that has been of great interest to me. Here is a man who's had a distinguished career in the visual arts. You've been an author, a curator, and certainly one of the foremost experts internationally on 20th century American art. You're also a program director for the National Endowment for the Arts. You've held other important administrative and board posts. And here we are in a fiscally starved city where very important services like hospitals, schools, sanitation, all the things that are of priority interest. And certainly, no one would question either of our commitment to the cultural life of the city, nor would we question the priority of those services. So obviously, what you've taken on is a difficult, but not insuperable task. Why did you do it? I did it for several reasons, the first of which sounds a bit sentimental. I, w I was born in Belgium, and we came to America in March of 1940. Uh, it was a time when it was a good idea for a Jewish family to leave Belgium. The Germans came in six weeks later. I went to New York City public schools until I was 14 years old. I love the city very much. I think it's exactly at this time that I can give back a gift of my time and my services for four years or eight years, however long it takes, to turn things around. I also believe in, uh, in my boss. 
I believe that Ed Koch has a vision. I, I, I was quoted in the uh, New York Magazine as saying uh, that he's not deeply committed culturally to any particular art form, and that I'm rather relieved by that, because if he had taste, it could be bad. He has enthusiasm, which is good, and his enthusiasm is terrific. That's w one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is, I think Ed Koch is going to help turn New York City around, and uh, I want to I be there. I want to help. You said that he is not committed to any particular art form. Obviously, there is one art form that is dominant in your own experience. How does that affect your evaluation of, for example, the performing arts, film, theater? How do you answer that question that must be posed to you frequently? It's posed to me frequently, and my answer to that is that when Roger Stevens and Nancy Hanks became the first and second chairman of the National Endowments and the Arts from the uh, performing arts fields, nobody from the museum field asked them to pr provide credentials that they were going to be fair. Uh, the presumption was that they were not monocultural, that they were interested in the entire uh, spectrum of cultural life, and I expect the same courtesy. That's a reasonable. Um, actually, there are some aspects of the performing arts that perhaps are from time to time and currently applied to the visual arts. And I'm thinking of the sensational loan shows that sometimes, with all of their pomp and circumstance, provide a popular appeal, similar to the performing arts, for the visual arts. Do you see that as a good way of involving wider numbers of people? I do, but, but you know, uh, I'm sure what you're thinking of is the late Cezanne show at the Museum of Modern Art last spring, which had lines around the block. It's taken America 60, 70 years to understand who Cezanne was, and the democratization of the arts through the open enrollment systems in colleges, through the art history courses which are available to everybody. America has become uh, really one of the prime nations in the world from the point of view of the appreciation of art. The museums have had a, a great role to play in that, and the Museum of Modern Art was a pioneer. And the Cezanne show intrigued me particularly. I, I worked out with uh, Dick Oldenburg, the director of the Museum of Modern Art, that the actual price of the admission uh, for the viewer mm -hmm. was about $16. They, what they paid was $2. The rest of the $14 had to be found in one way or another through National Endowment on the Humanities Grants, through endowment from the trustees, through uh, private corporations, through, through the, uh, the wealth of individuals, and, and yet uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind cost $4.50 and somebody made $100 million. Actually, it's an interesting point that you make that the Metropolitan Opera has always made that if that house were sold out for every week, every uh, performance uh, of their figure. season. I have a figure. Yes. New York, uh, New York City Opera, mm -hmm. fully sold out house, has to raise $8,000 every time the curtain goes up if every seat in the house is sold. And that no number has said, increased, by the way, for the Metropolitan sure, Opera. Sure, much by, by far, mm -hmm. because they pay much higher... Uh, salaries to their singers. No one has ever said that high art is cheap and uh, America is very unusual in the sense that it does not have uh, federally funded opera companies. The city of Hamburg gives more money to the arts than all the New York, all the 50 American states combined. They, they support a, an orchestra, they support an opera company, they support several theaters. There's a tradition in Europe, which is an old tradition, and it's based on the royal and the, uh, and the sacred traditions, that, uh, that high art is expensive. In America, we are constantly having to reteach ourselves that, and we're constantly amazed by it. My, 20, my $26 million yeah. out of $14 billion, uh, which is the New York City expense mm -hmm. budget, is one-sixth of one percent of the money that's spent by the city of New York. One-sixth of one percent is spent for our cultural life. Well, what are your prospects for bringing that figure up? You said that once the mayor gets the city in a sounder fiscal basis, and we oh, join oh. with you in hoping that that date is accelerated, but it doesn't seem in the foreseeable future. What well, we've do you had do some, in the meantime? We've had some tiny victories. We, for the first time, the Department of Cultural Affairs is going to have community development money. We've succeeded in getting $400,000 uh, 
in federal funds. Does that mean you are personally are looking for new sources of funding? Absolutely, which I hope to match through the National Endowment, which bring it up to 800000 I'm talking with the Department of Labor about a million dollar grant for an arts apprenticeship program, which would give $1,000 to the artist as a teacher and $5,000 to the apprentice as a student, so that it's a symbiotic relationship that makes sense from both sides. Do uh, is it, does any such program exist? No, it doesn't, but I've been down to the Department of Labor and the Secretary is extremely interested. And I, I think uh, we have every chance Sounds of success. Sounds like a fine idea. Tell us more Geldzahler Innovations. What else can we look forward to? We can look forward to continued performances in the uh, parks of the various boroughs through this summer and, and other summers. The Metropolitan Opera, the New York Philharmonic, and the uh, New York Shakespeare Festival, all funded by the Department of Cultural Affairs, are going to be performing during the months of June and July in parks in, in all five boroughs. That's not an innovation, but it's a bit of a fight to keep a lot of those programs going. I know of your concern with the outer boroughs, your concern with the emerging artists, with the ethnic population. How can you find either the staff or the funds, the time, the energy, to deal with this great vitality and ferment that is going on out there? I'm very fortunate in having a deputy commissioner, Janet Langsam, who uh, started with the department in October of 76 and who is my my wise counselor when it comes to the intricacies of working my way through budget and city council etc and I also have hired an assistant commissioner Gregory Millard who's black who has uh, formerly ran the Pacifica radio station in Washington who went to Harvard Law School and who has a, a is a playwright in, in, in his own right who has a, a very quick and firm grasp of, of these problems and we're busy. I'm not going to promise four months into an administration that we're coming up with answers, but uh, I, I feel very confident that through federal funding, uh, through the Expansion Arts Program of the National Endowment, through President Carter's new urban package, $20 million of which is going to uh, the cultural life of American cities. We're going, I, I have been down to Washington, I spoke last week at the Women's National Democratic Club and had Livingston Biddle and uh, Peter Kairos from the White House in the audience. I, I'm making the point over and over again that New York City is not foreign to America. It's not something other. Uh, I posited the body politic. If we have a body politic, we have a body cultural as well. And if New York City is the place where Robert Joffrey and Merce Cunningham decide to come from the state of Washington in order to form a dance company, it's because this is where the dance energy is. And they form that dance company from young dancers who themselves have come from all over the nation in order to learn to dance in New York under masters. After the companies are formed, they spend four months a year going back out to the country. And the, the continuous flow between New York and the rest of the country is something that I want to insist upon. And when they get a little bit older, they go out and they become the regional director of a dance company in, in their uh, original district. And there's a, there's a sense in Congress that New York is other, New York is foreign. New York is too close to the Caribbean, to Africa, and to Europe for the comfort of, of some rather unsophisticated legislators. And one of the reasons I'm traveling around the country and talking about New York in terms of a, a body cultural is to try to break down what I think is a, uh, a, a false barrier. I think that's very important. Uh, also for the funding that New York receives, I'm thinking of the program called New York Shares just to demonstrate not only to our lawmakers but to the country at large that when funds are given for a particular performance or exhibition to New York City, it may open in New York City or it may be organized in New York City but certainly circulates throughout the country. My favorite example is, is the New York School, the so-called New York School. The school of, of painting, you of mean. Painting. The, the School of Paris was Chagall from Russia Picasso and Juan Gris from Spain, Spain. Uh, Flamanc from the Flemish border, and Mondrian from Holland, that's the School of Paris. The School of New York is de Kooning from Holland, Rothko from Russia, Albers and Hoffman from Germany, Gorky from Armenia, uh, Jackson Pollock from Wyoming, Robert Motherwell from the state of California, Frank Stella from Massachusetts, Jasper Johns from South Carolina, and Bob Rauschenberg from Texas. That's the New York School. The reason they came to New York is that artists, just as, as uh, scientists, want to be where the uh, most 
innovative uh, thinking is going on in their field, artists want to be with each other, bouncing their ideas off each other, and they want to be where the greatest collections are, where they can hit their heads against the hardest and best that's been done. That's no reason that they have to stay here. George O'Keefe was in New York for six years, went back to New Mexico, having plugged into the highest energy available, and continued to flower in her own particular way. Not as a naive, primitive cave woman, but as somebody who, who knew the history of contemporary art. Same thing is true of Mark Toby, who came to New York and went back to the state of Washington and founded something called the Northwest Regional School. You make an interesting point, and an historical one as well. All of the artists that you have described have obviously have international distinction. What can we look forward to? What is the next wave, either in the visual or the performing arts? You're a, an insightful analyst of well, the avant-garde. I'm not a uh, prophet, and uh, Bob Rauschenberg, the painter, made the, the best comic when asked a question like that. Somebody said to him, what is the next movement in art going to be? And he said, I don't know, but I hope I'm in it. And my answer to that question is, I don't know what it's going to be, but I pray to God that I can recognize it when it happens, because I think that's my role. Well, how would you identify what is going on currently? I would say that the greatest energy in uh, the cultural life of America today is the explosion of dance. It, I would say that the 70s are a decade of dance. I think in the visual arts, it's a moment of retrenchment. It's a moment when you can't really identify a movement. Uh, the American experience of international acclaim in the 50s and 60s in the visual arts seems to have almost uh, freaked itself out to the point where it's Americana that we're back to. When you think of photorealism, when you think of, uh, of many of the, of the recent developments in American art, it reminds us more of the late 19th century or the 1930s than it does of what we now call the heroic years of the post-war period. I think it's in dance. I think the off-off Broadway theater, which is feeding Broadway continuously. If you saw the Tony Awards the other night, it's amazing how much of the energy in Broadway, which is our big commercial theater, comes from what we might call neighborhood, community, avant-garde. I think the, the feeding, the body cultural, in order to be healthy, has to be a continuum. And the, the false dichotomy between the elite and the populist is one that drives me up the wall because I, I, I think it's a continuum. I think that uh, if, if, um, if great music uh, isn't written by a Wagner and a Mahler in the late 19th century, then the pop tunes of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s are not going to have any place to come from. I think high art filters into popular culture and it's a continuous feed. If we can pause for a moment in our self-congratulation, perhaps we, city self-congratulation, I mean, perhaps we should focus for just a moment on the greatest efficiencies, the greatest lacks. What programs are the most <coughs> glaringly... Well, other than the fact that there's not enough money available to... That is a chronic develop, condition. That's a, well, but it, if you realize that... Uh, Two years ago, there was no money available in the program pot for New York City. There's now $250,000 available. We're doing somewhat better than we were. Uh, no other city has more than $50,000 available. On the other hand, no other city has a density of artistic population of New York. But beyond that, uh, another, I won't say chronic lack, but another problem that I have identified, and I've spoken to the mayor about it, is the crazy historic patchwork quilt of institutions that do get funding and don't get funding. Metropolitan Museum does get funding. What has been the criteria? The criterion is it's a city-owned building. The criterion is it's on public land. The criterion is that the contract was made 35 years ago when the city was still feeling flush. Lincoln Center, except for the New York State Theater, which belongs to the city, gets no uh, direct funding from the city. The Museum of Modern Art, which has a chronic uh, deficit of $1.8 million. And $1.8 million, interestingly enough, is the amount of money that it would cost to guard, maintain, heat, and light the Museum of Modern Art. To do for the Museum of Modern Art what we did for the Met would be to eliminate their deficit. I would like to see a... Their tower, too? Their tower is another issue, and uh, I think that's another whole half hour. Uh, my, my feelings about the tower are very, are very mixed. <coughs> I would like to see a rationalization. How can we make this more support. equitable? We have to have legal help in the sense that perhaps the Museum of Modern Art would have to give its building to the city in order for it to be uh, eligible. Is that uh, a possibility? I think it's a possibility. Another, another possibility is, th is that a, uh, 
a law be written that allows the city to make this kind of contractual agreement. With it's all the, of its primary and international institutions. Right, and you know the economic argument, which is the new conventional wisdom, that it's the cultural institutions which are the leaders in the attraction of tourism uh, to the city, and tourism is our second biggest industry after what used to be called the garment business, but is now called the apparel business for I some reason. I, I don't it's know It's because the prices have gone up. Oh, is that it? Um, do you think there is something potentially dangerous about tying culture to economic development? I, I hate it. It's the, it's the best way that I can get additional money from the mayor and from the Board of Estimate and from the City Council, but I do continually make the point that the economic argument for helping culture is not the reason that culture is important to us in our lives. Culture is important to us in our lives for very private and religious and aesthetic and uh, chilling reasons that with, without Without the literature, without the dance, without the paintings, and without the theater, our lives would be extremely empty. We don't stay in New York because of the potholes. We don't stay in New York because the subways are noisy. We stay in New York because of the great cultural opportunities that are available to us. The economic argument is a good way of getting money, but let's never confuse the argument with the reason. The reason for culture is something much more private and much more deep. In your short tenure, Henry, you've been a very effective advocate both in breaking new ground with the government, convincing the more skeptical among us of the need, importance, contribution of the department. Do you think some of that has to do with your own personal visibility, the fact that you came to the post as, and understand the spirit in which I ask you this, as a celebrity and an identifiable, a celebrity with expertise? Celebrity, you, you know the definition, is someone who's well known for being well known. That's Daniel Borston's right. definition. What is Henry Gelzauer's well, definition? Well, I must tell you that the uh, borough president of Manhattan asked me recently what I did before I was commissioner. So I'm not absolutely sure about the celebrity. Uh, within the art world, uh, I did have a certain visibility which was based on the fact that my friends, the painters, did portraits and that I was very busy lecturing, etc. I, I do think that it, it's a uh, plus in a job like this, which is partly an administrative job and partly a job of salesmanship, as you point out, to be a salesman. And the fact that I have a personality which uh, seems to be memorable to a few people is, is, is probably a plus. I think so, too. It's certainly going to be memorable to us. One last quick question, and that is, what would you like your major contribution to be in this job? You're a man with a sense of scale and a sense of history. I would like to bring the other major cultural institutions into the rational uh, city support, municipal philanthropic marriage, and I would like to uh, increase the amount of money available to the general population of New York for cultural affairs. I would like to be the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs during the period when Ed Koch helped turn the city around. Well, that is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Henry you. Geldzahler, for this lively, entertaining, informative conversation. And thank you, audience, for being with us, too.